who is going to talk a little bit about that history in particular, about how the Oneida Nation works with our federal, state, local legislators as well. So really the overlap, as we've been talking about so far, this entire class, of really how does government work, how does it function, and then what does it really mean for the people that are here, what does it look like on the ground. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over. We will let him talk, tell us everything we need to know in an hour. <laughs> Hopefully answer, uh, have some time for you guys to ask some questions, too, if you guys have some specific questions at the end. So with that, I will turn it over. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, having, having worked for Oneida for about 40 years um, in a number of different capacities, mostly administrative, um, but having a, an undergrad that's in social change and development and a master's degree from Harvard in administration planning and social policy, uh, I'm kind of hardwired to look at things through legislative terms. Uh, and so as I, as I look at what I might share with you today, um, I have so many things that I would love to share with you, uh, they're not going to fit in an hour. So uh, I'm going to try to, to hit some high points and uh, leave you time to ask me questions so that I can try to be responsive to what you really want to know. Um, there are currently 574 different federally recognized tribes. And historically, when Columbus arrived here, there were many, many more. Um, we are as diverse, we're more diverse, actually, than the nations of Europe. Um, there are currently still 12 different language families that are spoken in what's now the continental United States, what's usually referred to as the Lower 48. And those, those different languages are as different as German is to Swahili. I mean, there is no, there are no cognates. Uh, there is nothing in common. And so when one talks about speaking Indian, um, that's like saying speaking European. It doesn't, there isn't any one consistent way of, of speaking. There is a great deal of diversity. Uh, and many tribes are very proud of the fact that their languages are still spoken, and the foundations of who they are really rests with those languages. Um, if I were to say to you, um, how old are you? And I would say it in Oneida. I would say, what that means is, would be translated as, how old are you? But what it means literally is, how many winters have you broken? When you're speaking in a different language, the culture of that language permeates your, your thought process and directs you to think in a particular way. So when, when the tribes are speaking in their own languages, often they are speaking differently than you might expect them to. Um, and when, when you hear them singing hymns, understand that the, the words are not the same ones that you get in your prayer book. Um, but they are associated with that, that whole belief system. Um, so when, when Columbus first came here, he encountered all these people um, that were so diverse. Um, and it was at a time when the Pope had taken the position that American Indians were not Christians, and therefore they did not have souls. And if they didn't have souls, then basically the people of Europe could pretty much do what they wanted to do with the Indian folks. And it wasn't until the 1530s, uh, with uh, the advent of recommendations from a man named Francisco de Vittori, who was an advisor to the Spanish crown, who recommended that if the people in Europe could look at the people of the Middle East, whom he referred to as the Saracens and Jews and perpetual enemies of the people of Europe, as being human beings and as owning the land that they lived on, then how could it be that Europeans could not recognize that American Indians who had done them no harm, likewise, should have that, that understanding, that, that ability, that status? The treaty-making process was significant for a lot of reasons. It, it 
you know, when you think of who had the most weapons or who had the most advanced weapons and that type of thing, certainly Europeans were far advanced in that regard. But there were also an entire continent of Indian folks that were there, and they didn't have enough guns to take care of all of those. So the reality was there was a, a different kind of balance that was taking place. When, when Francisco de Vitoria convinced the Spanish crown to recognize tribal folks, it set the foundation for a treaty-making relationship. And the treaties were important not only between the Europeans and the tribes, but also between the Europeans and other Europeans. Because once a treaty had been made here, say the British made a treaty with Tribe X, and the French wanted to have a treaty with Tribe X for the same land or the same rights or the same resources, that could be argued in the courts of Europe and didn't require a war here, which was a very convenient thing at the time. So treaty making was helpful not only between the Europeans and the tribes, but also between Europeans and other Europeans. Now, when, when we start thinking about who these people were, who these Indian folks were, I was, I was uh, looking at myself in a mirror this morning, which is really not pleasant. Um, but as I was looking in the mirror, I was thinking, um, how could I share with you something that would, that would kind of shape your, your thinking about how different cultures are? And I was, I was uh, thinking of language. Um, the, the, when we start speaking in Oneida, one, we never have a word that requires that we put our lips together. Um, there are no what they call labials in the language. And, and our, our concepts are different. When we look at the sky and we see the stars, the constellations are different. Uh, the Lakota, have, they, they look at uh, Orion and see the hand of God. Um, we see the seven dancers that come across the sky and in the middle of winter come down to the horizon. So it's the seven dancers returning for the midwinter ceremony. And that tells us it's time for that to take place. The very foundations of how we see ourselves in the world are, are unique. Um, most people talk about the four directions. And obviously, those are associated with the cardinal directions. But I think that the Cherokee have another way of doing it, which is, which is helpful to understand, because it's the four cardinal directions plus the concept of up and down and the concept of ego. So their, their magic number is not four, it's seven. They have alignments around things in, in multiples of seven that um, kind of shape their world. I, I share this because I wanted you to think about not just that we're, we're people coming together for the purpose of making treaties and making governments. We're people that had to figure out other people and people that had very different ways of looking at the world. And so some of those early encounters were extremely challenging and very difficult. Now, Oneidas had, had been part of um, what you're probably more familiar with as, as the Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, for us, that's the Haudenosaunee. Um, we got to be known Iroquois because um, there was a French Indian War. You're familiar with that? Okay, so the French Indian War was actually the Seven Years' War in Europe. And when the French and the British came to these shores, they brought the war with them. They also made allies of the Indian nations here. And so the British allied with the Haudenosaunee, with our people. And the French allied with the Hurons, the bad guys. So we, so when you think of the French and Indian War, it wasn't Indians fighting Europeans. It was Indians and Europeans fighting Indians and Europeans. 
we ended up very early on in these alliances. And we also ended up uh, making, a, making a different cultural view uh, through what is known as the Gaswanta. The Gaswanta is a, it's a two-row wampum. And wampums are made of beads that come from a quahawk shell. And they're pur purple and white. The wampum belts are very significant because it's, it's a, you can equate it with like when you go into court and you put your hand on a Bible. When you're speaking and you're holding wampum, your words are to be the most exacting, the most, the most illuminating, but also the most beautiful words that you can choose. And so holding the wampum is, is really very significant. When the wampum strings are woven into wampum belts, they commemorate agreements, treaties. And these agreements then define what the relationship is and they have to be reviewed periodically um, because these are oral traditions and these are pictographs that are supporting oral traditions and it's important that everyone maintain in their memory the, the terms that were agreed to that's foundational. So we ended up with a, a treaty uh, that was with the Dutch in the uh, 1530s and uh, it was commemorated with the Gaswanta, but the Gaswanta carried on in our understandings with other European nations thereafter. So when the when they established the um, um, the Albany Congress, and Benjamin Franklin was assigned to liaise from the Albany Congress to the Iroquois, um, he learned about an upper house and a lower house. He learned about a government that was made up of the people. He learned of checks and balances. But also he saw in action a government that recognized the role of women as much as the role of men. The Europeans had a very difficult time with that. So with the Treaty of Canandaigua, for instance, the Seneca women were extremely articulate in their position in support of the, the Iroquois position. Um, but the obviously the American women were not allowed to speak. So we are a body made up of, of uh, men and women with defined roles for both genders, but complementary roles. And our roles are not superior one to the other. They complement one another. So when you have a government of the people, which was unlike what was being contemplated in Europe at the time. The government there was, it allowed for voices outside of government to make recommendations, to advocate for policies, to develop perhaps even laws. But it was always white men who got to have that responsibility. In Indian country, the tribes were the decision makers. The tribal members were the governed, but they were also the ones that collectively knew what was important for them, what, they, what their decisions meant, and the impact of those decisions impacted all of them. So this was truly a government of the people in a way that was unlike anything contemplated in Europe at the time. Benjamin Franklin said, if these savages can have a government like this, why can't we? The reality was that there was a whole different model, a very different foundational piece that contributed to who we were and how we saw the world. We had um, the Treaty of Canandaigua uh, was in 1794, and that too built from the the, the concept of of uh, the Gaswanta, the Turuwamu. But it also built from what we call the, uh, the covenant chain. And that is, a, that is a chain made up of three links, um, in, including um, respect and um, 
you see here. Um, basically, it's, it's the, the concept of, of relating with one another in a respectful way. And the, the, what is required is that the chain be polished on an annual basis. That is to say, you have to revisit it. You have to remember it. You have to uh, enforce it so that it becomes foundational to who you are. And that, that is very, um, a very integral part of who we are. Um, when, we, when we think about how peoples came together, education is one of the things that seems to be a major factor. Um, and we can talk about that from kind of both sides of the fence as well. Um, in 1774, uh, the, uh, the College of William and Mary uh, offered to educate six sons of the Iroquois chiefs. Now that was probably, there was probably a couple reasons for that, not the least of which was with the uh, impending Revolutionary War, they wanted to make friends with the Iroquois. But the, this wasn't the, our first rodeo. So when they started inviting our kids to come to school free, that's, um, we, uh, we were dubious about why that was. Um, the chiefs responded uh, by saying, you who are wise must know that different nations have different conceptions of things. And you will therefore not take it amiss if our ideas of this kind of education happen not to be the same with yours. We are nonetheless obliged by your kind offer, though we decline accepting it. And to show our grateful sense of it, if the gentlemen of Virginia will send us a dozen of their sons, we will take great care of their education, instruct them in all we know, and make men of them. So education was recognized by our people, as well as your people, as the way to prepare the next generation, um, and to do so with the things that were of value to you as, as the, the parents, as the individuals associated with the, the process of education. The Bureau of Indian Affairs, it was actually still the Indian Service back in the day. Um, in, the, uh, in 1879, uh, established Carlisle Indian School. It's probably most notably um, recognized for Jim Thorpe, who was uh, one of the world's best athletes. Um, but Carlisle Indian Industrial School um, was a facility that was really dedicated to changing uh, what was foundational in Indian country. Um, children were sent there. Uh, under the concept of kill the Indians, save the man. If, if the tribes could be um, made to lose their languages, lose their cultures, lose their traditions, uh, if they were used to wearing their traditional attire and they were now being put into cut down military uniforms, when their hair was cut, they were being reprogrammed into something else. When, when um, Carlisle was established, um, virtually everything about it was intended to simply remake Indian people into brown white people. It was not preparing them for any, any kind of significant employment or any significant role uh, and most of the graduates of most of the schools, the women ended up becoming domestics. Um, they, they were taught to cook and taught to sew and taught to clean. And the boys were taught, some learned some blue collar trades, um, some were farmers. But in the summers, they would be farmed out to the local communities where they would be paid for their services. Um, but half of the money they received went to them, and the other half went to the, the Bureau of Schools. Um, 
the, uh, the individuals had, had to buy things from the school store, um, kind of like the old concept of the, the company store. Um, and once they got money, it all had to go to reimburse the, the store for whatever was purchased. What that meant was there, there was no money left over for them to be able to go back home. My, um, my grandfather went to Carlisle. My mother went to Flandreau. Flandreau was a BIA boarding school in South Dakota that was based on the Carlisle model. It became, well, by, by the 1960s, it was another of what were 406 Indian schools across the country. So we had people going to these schools being reprogrammed and having a very difficult time when they came back home to fit in. Um, I recall there was <laughs> uh, back in the in the '60s with uh, with Kennedy when he was uh, advocating for putting a man on the moon, and scientists had decided that they had the capacity to get a person to the moon, but they weren't sure that they could get him back. Um, an author called Vine Deloria suggested that they send an Indian to the moon on relocation, and he'd find his own way back. There was a, a federal program called Relocation that was intended to get Indians off of the reservation and into the urban environments, or at least away from their community. Um, relocation was, uh, it, uh, was an, an effort to get people to, to leave home, um, whether they could speak their language, whether they had any marketable skills, was secondary to the concept of getting them off the reservation. You see, the tribes have had, had established these treaties with the United States and other agreements, and there were passages of laws over time that ensured that they were to have certain services provided in, uh, in compensation for what they had given up. But when Indians, if Indians didn't exist anymore, uh, if, the, if they weren't resident on the reservation, if they weren't functioning as a tribe, then those obligations to provide services went away. The feds decided that, that Indians could be Indians if they were one quarter degree Indian blood quantum. So they took what was a governmental agreement and made it into, at least partially, a racial one. With the assumption that eventually tribes would not have sufficient blood quantum and then the liabilities would go away. It was kind of the, the inverse of what was going on with black Americans at the time. Um, are you guys familiar with a case called Plessy v. Ferguson? Okay, separate but equal and all that. Okay. So the, the concept was uh, Plessy was, was uh, a black man who was obligated to ride in the, in the back black car on the train, um, but he was he was what they then called an octoroon, which meant he was one eighth black. One eighth black was sufficient for him to be black. If you're less than a quarter degree Indian, you're not enough Indian to be Indian. The laws then adapted to accommodate the policies going on around us. Um, in 1970, there was a, a Time magazine article uh, before there was an internet. Magazines like Time were, were really big stuff and, and people relied on them for uh, in-depth review of, of issues. Newspapers, newspapers have basically covered day-to-day -day stuff um, magazines like Time and Life and whatever, they, they would do more investigative reporting. Um, in 1970, the Time reported that the American Indian had become, well, what they said was the first American had become the last American in every socioeconomic category. 
we were behind in education, we were behind in employment, we were behind in land, we were behind in everything. The policies that had evolved had basically taken everything from us. And so it was time to make some changes. And there were some changes, some dramatic changes. Um, President, uh, well, let's see, before that, uh, there was a committee established uh, by Bobby Kennedy, who was then back in the Senate, um, and his brother Teddy was also on the committee, uh, Edward Kennedy. Um, they established a, a body to investigate uh, the situation in Indian country, and they submitted a report called Indian Education, a National Challenge, a National Indian Education, a National Tragedy, a National Challenge. The, the, the reality was that there was, a, there was a need to address things in Indian country, and education was one way that they felt um, there was a, a, a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, now, that then led to some other things. Nixon in 1970 uh, came up with the, the concept of Indian self-determination. The, the idea being that a tribe um, was, was devastated at this point as a result of all the policies that had been imposed upon it. It was going to be the tribe that, through successful directions in the future, was going to be able to bring the, bring the people back. Now, the, one, of the, one of the failings of that process, and there were many, um, but one was that they didn't tell the other folks what, what they were doing, really, in any, in any meaningful way. I mean, Nixon just turned the policy around overnight, and suddenly Indian treaties were going to be recognized again, and suddenly Indian rights were going to be recognized, and they, they could hunt, and they could fish, and they could gather, and they could do all these things that other folks couldn't do. And so, all of a sudden, you ended up not just with, with uh, people being quizzical about this, ended up with anti-Indian groups coming forward in spades. Um, you had equal rights for everyone, and stop treaty abuse, um, pase comataras, um, and Citizens Equal Rights Alliance. All of these were groups that believed that Indians were getting something special, and they needed to be contained and controlled. And what tribes were doing was what the president had said they were authorized to do. They were doing what made sense for them to generate revenue, to begin to rebuild their economies, rebuild their culture and society. We had, in Wisconsin, um, a classic problem. All of this was, was happening at the same time. You had, in 1972, there was the Indian Education Act. So you had Indians going back to school and learning, among other things, how it was that they had lost so much. I mean, the Ojibwe had given up one third of the state and had retained the right to hunt, fish, and gather as a quid pro quo. But Wisconsin forgot that part of it. So, the Ojibwe had lost, essentially lost their rights. And when you were being sent to a school that didn't allow you to learn about yourself, didn't allow you to learn about being Indian or didn't understand the treaties and all the relationships that existed, you didn't know how to fight that, how to combat that. But when they went to school, they started to learn. In 1975, there was passage of the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act. What that did was downsize the BIA. In 1970, there had been a lot of money thrown by the feds at Indian issues. But almost all of the money was, was eaten up in the bureaucracy to provide the services that there was no money left to provide. So we had people telling us by their, by their, their standard of, of uh, meeting um, this obligation to the tribes, um, they would attend a meeting and say, well, there's simply no money for them. 
um, the had, in fact, in 1970, had all the money that had been awarded, allotted for uh, Indian programs been given directly to American Indians, there would have been no Indians below the poverty level. But that obviously wasn't happening. The bureaucracy was feeding itself. When Nixon in, um, got, got government looking at things differently, in 75 there was the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act that downsized the BIA and with the monies that were left over, those dollars were shared with tribes to provide the services for themselves. So since the federal government had done such a poor job of meeting their obligations, the money was now going to the tribes and the tribes could now do that for themselves. And so you suddenly saw tribes establishing police forces, schools, health centers, um, housing, the, the, whist, the list goes on and on. I was, uh, I was a general manager for Oneida for a time. And during that period, I was responsible for five divisions, 1,700 employees. And we were doing a lot of things. The, the 1,700 people that I had, that was the government side of the house. That wasn't gaming. Um, so that was, that was all being made possible primarily by gaming because gaming was was the foundation that was going to make up for the fact that we were not getting the federal dollars that we were supposed to have gotten and it was going to give us the capacity to truly be self-determining remember Nixon's message was about Indian self-determination but you can't be self-determining if you're basically being told by the feds what you're going to do what the goals are, what the reports look like, all of that stuff, you're, you're actually reacting to uh, a government that's telling you what you're supposed to believe. That's not self-determination. Self-determination requires that you be self-sustaining. And the tribes didn't have the resources to be able to, uh, to even invest in business. Um, there was, the, the only assets they had really were some lands that were in trust. And in federal trust, that means that the United States has the title, not the tribe. So the tribe had nothing with which to even go to a bank and say, we need money for this particular development or this particular idea. When gaming came along, Gaming was something that had been opposed. Well, first of all, gaming was something that paid for a lot of the Revolutionary War. Uh, there were big time lotteries that were going on, and it was a few years after the war that corruption hit and, and they got outlawed. But when, when tribes started looking at gaming as a potential um, funder for the services that, that might help their growth, the people that had opposed it were the churches and the states. Historically, the, those two entities did not support gambling. And so they had passed laws and uh, had policies that uh, changed uh, how they would deal with that. And then when they suddenly decided that maybe casino nights and bingo weren't so bad and state lotteries weren't so bad, they were already there when the tribes came forward. And so the, the deal was they were already in it. Then it was about preserving market share more than it was the high moral ground. And so the tribes began to, to look at gaming as a vehicle for generating revenue. And we had all kinds of people opposing us. Donald Trump was one of them. He had uh, casinos out on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. Um, and I recall being in DC, uh, Trump was invited to give testimony uh, along with Torricelli, who was then the, uh, the, the uh, member of the assembly from, or the member of the house from New Jersey. 
um, and they were giving testimony before the House Resources Committee. And Trump was saying Indians didn't look like Indians to him, and they were rife with uh, crime and, and all kinds of things. It was, he rambled on and on for 20 minutes. And uh, George Miller, um, uh, a member from uh, California, uh, finally said he, he accused Trump of being a Nazi. And, and unfortunately, all of the media that were in the room ostensibly to learn about whether Indian gaming was a good thing or a bad thing or a, an honest thing or a corrupt thing or whatever. They were there for that, for that purpose. But when Trump got up and walked out of the room, they all walked out of the room with him. The story became whether or not George Miller telling Donald Trump he was a Nazi was what was going to carry the day. That was going to get the ink. The next panel that spoke was from the Department of Justice that said that everything that Trump had just said was outrageous and unfounded, and there was nobody there to cover it. Like the problems in Wisconsin, people weren't researching down to what the issues really were. They weren't understanding what was going on in a way that, that allowed them to come forward with reasoned solutions. And that was, that was what we tried to pick up on through the American Indian Language and Culture Education Board. The, um, this body, the American Indian Language and Culture Education Board, was made up of, of 15 Native folks uh, appointed by their tribes and uh, then selected um, by the governor. And originally, we were supposed to give recommendations on education, but since everything was blowing up everywhere, the expectation was that we were going to advise the governor and the legislature on things that were happening across the board in Indian country. So we tried to get people to to look at things in a way that that resulted in, in more than bless you in more than wringing of hands and wishing things would go away, but to start to research and understand what was really going on, what were the what were the issues at hand, and so we we decided that there needed to be a point of intervention. The the members of the legislature weren't doing it. Uh, educators weren't doing it, um, and what was unfortunate was that in that vacuum, you had the anti-Indian organizations that were catching all the ink. They were the ones that were bringing forward the messages about what was going on, and most of it was totally outrageous. It was it was unfounded. It didn't it didn't have historical grounding, but it was what people understood. You have to remember, Indians weren't allowed to learn about themselves. But everybody else were introduced to what was real in Indian country. By design, Indians were supposed to be reprogrammed into something. But most Americans, what they knew about Indians was that they lived until about the 1850s and hung out in teepees and chased buffalo. And then they went away. They weren't part of the, the modern history. They weren't part of the, the contemporary America. They weren't the people that had intergovernmental agreements with the United States. They weren't the people that had treaties. They were just a bunch of folks. And until we could, we could get down into the, into the weeds and start to learn about some of the things that were real, about this intergovernmental relationship. We could never resolve it. The Language and Culture Board recommended that the state um, establish a, a, a process to educate people in Wisconsin about the 11 tribes and bands and their sovereignty and their history and culture. And that was those concepts were built into a budget bill. 
that was that year, Act 31. Um, Act 31 still is in existence today, um, and it's understood by most people as an Indian education bill, but it was really just a budget bill that had some Indian education stuff plugged into it. In Wisconsin, there is local control. So school boards make the decision for what's going to be taught in the schools. Um, they, they approve it or disapprove it. And when we're talking about getting, getting people educated about, about tribes, like everything else, the school, dis, the school board has to make the decision to, to approve some information, not approve others, and so on. So we knew that if we were to provide one concept of um, Indian history and culture and so on, that the school boards would oppose it just on, on the fact that it was in opposition to local control. So what we did was we provided as much information as we possibly could. We enlisted academics. Um, we got faculty members from, from various campuses in the UW system um, to develop informational pieces that could become part of curricula that schools could incorporate. I, I, was, uh, I was asked to go to various school boards at the time um, and try to educate them about what it was we were doing and, and how we were doing it. And many of those were, were very cordial and, and informational and, and helpful, just sharing of information. Others were um, pickup trucks with rifles in the back windows and, uh, and an assurance that by one um, school board chairman that uh, he was going to uh, park his, his pickup truck next to the principal's desk before he was going to let any of that Indian shit into his school. There was a whole raft of different kinds of ideas about what was out there. And so many of them were just just patently wrong. From 1989 forward, um, Act 31 has continued to uh, function in the schools, and I think it's had an impact. Um, I'm pleased that uh, there are many people now that, that uh, came through the school systems in Wisconsin that know something of the tribes and understand the, the dynamics that were at play. Um, and I think um, it's a, um, I, I was uh, an assistant chancellor at, at uh, UWGB, and uh, I, I would teach uh, at least one course a semester. Um, and I, I've had students come back to me um, who have been doing wonderful things in, the, in their professional careers. Um, and I found that to be one of the most rewarding things in my life. Um, let me see what else I, I'll share with you before, before I open it up for questions. Um, when, when we think of gaming, um, of all the things that we might do, um, I think what was frustrating was we had um, in the, in the Bureau of Education system, we had uh, people in cut down military uniforms, and among the things they were taught to do was play musical instruments. So a lot of Indian tribes had national bands. Um, but many of the tribes had, had pretty much um, faded away or been negatively affected. And among those was the, the Pequot in Connecticut. They were just a, a small band of of uh, tribal members um, who, when there was passage of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, um, decided that they were going to try to, to uh, use gaming as a vehicle for generating money for their programs as well. And so the law was set up in such a way that the states were not eligible to receive any money from the tribes because the tribes' funds were supposed to be used for the purpose of operating their governments. So they paid for the schools and law enforcement and all that stuff. 
Um, and so the, the, the concept of, of uh, uh, utilizing those funds to pay taxes or other fees was restricted so that states could only recover things that were negotiated in a compact. So if, if the state said that it would be willing under the terms of the compact to provide um, uh, regulatory oversight or security or other kinds of functions, states could be compensated for the services that they actually provided, but they weren't eligible for any funds beyond that. The, the Pequot in Connecticut said to the state of Connecticut, and they just happened to be between most of New England and Atlantic City, and they said, well, if, if you'll allow us to have the exclusive right to have gaming in Connecticut, we'll pay you, state of Connecticut, 25% of our earnings. Now that was beyond the scope of the law, and it was beyond what many thought the feds would, would allow. But they agreed to it. And governor's ears went up all over the country. My God, if we could, if we could get Indians to think that they're getting an exclusive right to something and pay us for it, that's almost as good as getting taxes and the other stuff that we were looking for. So the, the concept then began to change. Um, suddenly tribes were working with the states and you also had a dynamic where like Donald Trump was, was uh, looking over his shoulder and realizing that he was doing all that he could do to kill Indian gaming as competition to his facility in Atlantic City. But all of the other people were negotiating agreements with the tribes, recognizing that instead of now being only in two states, they could be in 30-some states. And so Trump was out there all by his lonesome, and the only successful casino that he ever had was the one that his first wife ran for. Um, everything else went south. So the, the, the majority of tribes, however, going into gaming, were very successful. And when people were, were questioning how the tribes were using their funds, um, we had posters of police forces and health centers and schools um, stacked up outside the, the hearing rooms next to pictures of, of other uh, casino owners and their, their yachts and their golf courses and their, their uh, other signs of opulence. And when it became clear that Indians were doing something that was actually benefiting the whole race of people, that had an impact. And then when the tribes began to start hiring more and more folks that were not even tribal folks. We had a whole bunch of people out there that were now also reliant on the resources of the tribe to generate opportunity for them as well. And the state began to recognize that these employees are now paying state taxes and they're buying things and it's impacting the economy. Indian gaming is now the largest employer in every county in which there is a tribe. That's a huge impact on the, on the state overall. And it's, it's something that we didn't, I don't think, appreciate when we first started all this. But it was something, it was, it was a horse we rode. And it's, uh, it's, worked, it's worked quite well. Um, You know, maybe I'll just I'll just stop with that because we've got about 15 minutes left. What would you guys like to know? I'm very pleased that you all stayed away. Okay. Yes. Um, this is more like just based on the trial, literally. Some of you referred to the 
Um, we have we have many. Um, I mean, you can imagine it's 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 a life culture. So um, there is a priority on preserving the language. There is um, there there are ceremonies um, that take place throughout the course of the year. Uh, everything in the in the world is divided into one of twelve categories, and so the ceremonies then acknowledge those things. We don't we don't uh, look at it as as we're um, uh, seeing a deity in each of those things. What we're what we're saying is we we give thanks for all things in creation that they continue to carry out their responsibilities, and so each of the twelve things then covers. Um, Things from from plants and water animals and, and medicines and, and um, different different things come up at different times of the year. The, uh, there's a recognition for the animals, and there's a first among each category. So among the among the animals, the first is the deer. Uh, among the among the um, fruits, strawberries are first. So they're they're the first fruit that comes in the spring. And there is a ceremony dedicated to them. I don't know if you've ever seen wild strawberries, but they're about the size of your little finger. It's, it's a lot of work to harvest those. Um, but the the um, the tribe continues uh, to honor its traditions, and its traditions are actually different than than the powwow, for instance. Um, we we have the powwow because it's a it's a uh, a gathering that brings us together as a collective, and it's it's a, a, a composite of a number of different tribes. Um, Oneida's um, recognition is is unique to its particular culture. We are we are well. Oneidas are known as Ono de Aga. Ono de Aga is the people of the Standing Stone, and we are Umwahumwe, um, real people, the original people. Authentic people. It doesn't translate easily, but it's kind of in there somewhere. Um, and we have um, traditions that that allow us to um, support one another. That um, again are grounded in the in the language. So um, our language has four genders. There's a high and low feminine gender. So elder women have their own gender as a sign of respect. Um, and then there's younger, younger women, girls, and animals. And then um, male and, and neuter. But the, the language is, is it, it just kind of frames how we, how we see things. Um, we have longhouses. Um, and the, the Aganos is the longhouse. It is seen as, as it was when we were still in New York. Um, it's a it's a long um, facility that are now stick built, but back in the day they used to be uh, made with elm bark. Um, but they would be uh, east to west, and the women's store was always to the east, men's store was to the west, and there would be in the in the roofs there would be a smoke hole for each one of the families in the in the longhouse. Um, because we're matrilineal, when there would be a marriage, the husband would become part of his wife's clan. He would move into his wife's longhouse and, and exist with her. Um, we, wow, um, we have, have uh, oh, let me, let me tell you a funny story. Um, there's a, uh, I actually told this story at my daughter's wedding. When, it, when, a, um, when a man wants to get married, and this is, this is a gag, it's not, not at all the real ceremony and, and the obligation, but when, whenever you hear something, it says, what that, that's, that's kind of like the Oneida version of once upon a time. It's the, it's the way you introduce a story. Uh, and it, it means like the Oneidas, um, this, that's, this is their ways. But, um, Well, um, 
la na kali isla isi kari hoy nahi kai kam ko hai is chikai yun hoy to ant kala ta nahi nahi yun ani chit kai puta chit hai du ma dario to ya ta nahi kala ho da to ne aaye ke no bia no dore ho hai da to ne aaye ta nahi no bua se bua sa na kali se hai so it says when when a guy is ready to get married he drags a pole around behind him in the village and a woman who's interested in marrying him will grab the other end of that pole and collectively they go down to the creek and they put the pole across the creek and they try to cross it together and if they make it across they're considered married and if they fall in he has to drag the pole again <laughs> so um you know you when you think of culture you um kind of as i began you know it's i'm i'm more higher hardwired to look at at uh at government and law and policy and and so on but it's really things like that um the 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 visual things that that go with the language that you see that that lets you know that you're in a different place it's it's a different understanding and that's a that's something that's always very special when i when i talk with my uh, my people in my language So you mentioned you were part of like the legislator in Oneida Nation. I'm sorry. You mentioned that you were part of like the legislator um, in Oneida Nation. Well, I was I was um, I was director of legislative affairs, and um, as such, um, <coughs> we have a Indian country is in a very unique place because when I was when I was younger. Um, Oneidas uh, were, were were very much ob 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 uh, engaged in their own tribal government and their own leadership and policies and directions and so on, um, to the exclusion of being involved outside. But in in uh, in 1924, um, there was the Indian Citizenship Act. Indians had fought in the First World War, and they came back home, um, and they, by virtue of being in the military, were now citizens, but their wives and children were not. And so the federal government passed a law that made all Indians citizens of the United States. But they, they also recognized, because there had been many policies where something was done to affect Indian country, where at the end of the day, it ended up being worse than what existed before. And so the Indian Citizenship Act conferred citizenship on all Indians, but did not take anything away. And so the, the, what it essentially established was uh, a dual citizenship. So individuals are members of their own respective tribes and, respective, and, and the United States. Okay. Now, in that environment, we have, what, there's 435 members of Congress, um, and most of them are from districts that, uh, 435 members of the House, and most of them are from districts that um, don't have Indian country in them. If you look at how decisions are made in D.C., um, they usually work on what they call a CHIT system. I do something for you, you do something for me. If I need this vote, I want you to be there when I need it. I'll take care of you and back and forth. The problem with that is if Indians are just a chit in the system, we're in big trouble. Because it would be very easy for somebody without an Indian constituency in his or her district to say, well, yeah, uh, we can wipe them out. That's no skin off my nose. What we need to do then from a tribal perspective is educate, 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 educate. We need to be able to reach out to people and have them understand what the implications are. 
most of them don't understand that, that the majority of people that work for Indian tribes now are not tribal people. And so there's a whole different constituency out there that, that relies on the tribes to be able to, to uh, put, put food on the table. So legislative affairs for Oneida means going to, going to Washington, going to Madison. It means um, educating members on what the issues are, answering questions, encouraging people to understand. Um, I had the privilege of writing floor speeches for members of Congress when I was doing that stuff back in the day. Um, and it was always really rewarding to me to, to think about being this little old Indian guy back in, on the res in Wisconsin. Um, and if my words came from my mouth, they would have meant nothing. But if my words come from a member of Congress on the floor, that means something. So Ledge Affairs gave me entree to, to do some things that I would not have been able to do otherwise. Um, and it was, it was a, an extremely rewarding time, a very crazy time, but a rewarding time. Okay, I had to. I was going to say, I do want to give students a chance to get to the next classes. Now. Oh, sure. We're too much over. But I do want our students to thank our guests for the.